Turning. There we go. Hey, everybody. This is Sean and Mary with Indulge. Welcome, welcome. We are excited, first and foremost, that we connected to the Facebook Live platform on Wine it's Wednesday. It's working, I think. It is working, we hope. As people come online, just let us know that we're actually broadcasting. Last week, we did our first Wine Wednesday, and there was so many people on Facebook that the, the feeds weren't working. So we're excited. Um, Mary and I are responsible for Vindulge, a wine and food website based in Oregon wine country. And uh, we are very excited to start hosting these Wine Wednesdays where we can talk to uh, people throughout the wine, beverage, and food community throughout the Northwest and elsewhere. And especially right now, while all of us are at home all day, every day, with, with our, our kids. kids and our family, Oh, I love my family. Um, Homeschooling. Uh, we uh, it would also be an entertaining opportunity for all of us to hang out, to so grab a glass of wine, or bonus points if it's an Oregon wine or a Northwest wine. Um, a few things. First, uh, we are so excited to have Melissa Berg from Stoller uh, here today. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, of course. We do want to disclose that we are wine club members, have been proudly for many, many years. So quick disclosure. And today we're talking about wine and food. So the intended audience are those of you over the age of 21 in the United States. So we just want to make sure we did our thing to make sure everybody was on the same page. Um, so that said, we are very excited to have Melissa here. Um, Melissa, I mean, very few introductions in the Oregon wine community, but for those of you around the country uh, or around the world who may be watching this, uh, Melissa, I believe you've been part of the Stoller group for 17 years. Yeah, going on that this August will be 17 years. That's amazing. And I think that, um, I mean, well, one of the things we remember when we first moved to Oregon in 2006 is is you know the smaller production facility that still used to be so growing from like a thousand cases a year to well over what sixty thousand or more cases, well over absolutely yeah oh, well over, uh, and not that you you know have a lot of downtime but you also collaborate on the history brand which we'd be happy to get into and the can project I mean we love that um, uh, through and through but. Uh, you know, today, I think we really just wanted to talk to you about what's going on, especially in the current climate, uh, entertain many of our readers. Um, for those of you watching live, feel free to share this, tag your friends who are sitting around drinking some wine. Um, and yeah, Mary, you want to kick it off? Yeah. Well, I think first of all, I mean, I would love for you to share a little bit about Stoller and what you do. But first, I just want to know, how are you guys doing? Like, what is, how are you and your team doing right now? Well, I think everybody's trying to adapt as best as all we all can. And the team is doing just that. You know, we're changing the way we work. We've closed the tasting room, which for, for obvious you know, and legal reasons. So that's completely shut. But we are doing a drive through pickup. So we have that on the daily right now at between certain times. And it's really well done lots of distancing and safety and, and all that people can come and pick up their club shipments or things they call in for uh, so that's happening we've got a lot of our team that was uh, originally working in the tasting room on the floor with guests doing other projects a lot of call campaigns repurposing people to do things and then in production it, we, we're still going. I mean, wine still needs to get filtered and, and bottled ideally, and the vines don't stop growing, you know, obviously. So we have both the production team and the vineyard operations out there. But even within that um, working environment, we're adapting a lot to uh, trying to keep the number of people doing these jobs at a minimum, definitely lots of distancing and all that. So it's crazy. You know, we're really trying to keep up with everything on a daily and hourly basis and do the best we can. And the goal is to, you know, first and foremost, keep people safe and keep people healthy and then, you know, hopefully keep things moving. So I, I keep, I'll keep saying it's crazy probably a whole bunch of times, but that's what, that's what it is. We do have, you know, we do have a lot of things happening. We're we're also working actively, the marketing department's doing triple time, I would say, 
because we are launching um, very, very soon a wine channel called the Stoller Wine Channel. Nice. And there'll be, yeah, it's exciting. There'll be more to come on that. We're going to roll that out and announce the startup on both Facebook and Instagram, kind of give little hints to when that's coming. It's very soon. And it's a channel that's all about food, wine, and lifestyle. So it's pretty cool. We've got a lot of fun stuff on there. We've got cooking, cooking demonstrations, wine stuff. You can learn about people on our team, a lot of collaborations with chefs. So more to come on that. But that's that's one thing. And then we just announced today uh, that we, uh, something that's come together really quickly is we have partnered with Meals on Wheels and The Botanist and also Young's Market, our Oregon, our distributor here locally is helping us to work to have the products that we make with the Stoller Wine Group, which is all five of our brands, a uh, percentage of sales goes to help what The Botanist and Meals on Wheels is doing for the community. So I'm really proud about that. And so we're just we're just trying to keep up, try to be helpful, and, and all that stuff in this in this time right now. Wow! So I realized before we got into that, we didn't actually. There's a lot of readers that do not are a lot of our Facebook fans that are not necessarily in Oregon. So can you yeah. actually tell us a little bit about Stoller and just briefly the history? Last week we interviewed um, a very small winemaker. So now we've got Stoller and you've got, you know, you mentioned five different brands. So can you just mention a little bit about who you are, where you guys are located and, and what kind what wines you make? Sure. So yes, we're Oregon uh, focused brand and Stoller is now called Stoller Wine Group. Uh, just to rewind quickly, when I started working for Stoller Family Estate, it was a, a brand, a small wine brand that was uh, centered around an estate vineyard in the Dundee Hills, which is a growing region here in our state, which is southwest of Portland. And the owner, Bill Stoller, had at that time a quite large vineyard and sold most of the fruit to other producers, but wanted me to be the winemaker to make a very small, less than a thousand cases, right around there, quantity of wine. And since then we've grown to this Stoller Wine Group, which encompasses, like I had mentioned, five brands. And under that umbrella of the five brands is Shehalem. So Shehalem is a winery that is located in Newburgh and Bill Stoller has been co-owner of that winery for over 25 years. And the last two years, uh, he ended up purchasing all the ownership of that brand. So we have that in our umbrella again of, of, the, of the brands. And we also, recently launched two new brands. We have one called Chemistry. And Chemistry is a, a retail facing brand, Willamette Valley Fruit. There's a Pinot Noir, uh, a Rosé and a Pinot Gris. And those wines you find in, in the grocers and they're meant to over deliver and really source this epic fruit out here and make this quality value wine. And we also, the other recent brand is Canned Oregon, where we we work with fruit from Oregon across the state and we have five different wines uh, in a can. So it's you know, literally a half a bottle of wine and it's you know portable and pretty eco-friendly because it's lightweight recyclable material, it's aluminum. And so that's been really exciting. Those two new projects just took a lot of you know, time and energy, but we're all really excited about where they're going. And then the fifth, the fifth uh, brand is History, which you had mentioned briefly, Sean, and it's a brand that I started in 2013 and partnered with Stoller shortly thereafter. And it is the smallest of all five brands. And it's a, a brand that we focus on working with the oldest vineyards in the Pacific Northwest and make small amounts of wine from these sites. For example, I had worked with a vineyard that had the very first Cabernet Sauvignon that was ever planted in the state of Washington from a vineyard called Otis. And I made a couple hundred cases of that Cabernet up until that vineyard and, and sadly ended up taking out that old vine section. And I work with some fruit from my mother-in-law's property, which is really a catalyst for this all. She's got a beautiful property in the Columbia Gorge in White Salmon, Washington. And there's 12 acres there that were planted in the late sixties, Pinot Noir and Gewurztraminer. So I've made wines from, from that site and there's a whole collection, but that's a, it's been really neat to have this diversity. And yeah, I've been at Stoller for 17 years and certainly have seen the tremendous growth, not only at Stoller with the wine group and with what we're doing, but with the wine community in the industry. And it's really neat to be part of this community for so many reasons, but the amount of you know blood, sweat, tears and people's passions and dedication to Oregon wines is exciting to see really 
come to fruition more and more every year. And Oregon, I feel like now is is a global a global wine de growing destination. And I think that's fantastic, especially when you think about how small the production is in the state of Oregon. We only make 1% of all the wine that's made in the United States. So that's that's pretty small. California by far is well over 90% of, of volume of, of wine and brands and SKUs and all that stuff. So for a small producing state to get to where we are, it's pretty phenomenal. That, that's awesome. Uh, one question coming in live is, uh, around distribution. So can you get the wines in Indiana or can you tell us a little bit about where you distribute throughout North America? We're in, I think almost 40 states, maybe pushing a little bit more than that. So we're very well distributed right now, specifically in Indiana. I wish I knew off the top of my head, I should, but we have a, on our website, um, I think there's a good trade section that will tell you, but we are working on getting into as many states as possible. And um, yeah, we can sell from our our website. So if that's another thing too, you can always call and I could verify that too. But yeah, we're very well distributed across the US now with our size, especially with the three, with our Dundee Hills tier, which I have a few of these wines we'll talk about later, but th these are the wines that you'll find across the US. Nice. So speaking of distribution, what kind of challenges have you guys seen when it comes to this craziness that's happening and like just i've heard of wineries that have you know they r restaurants are closing you know they've had to take shit back from restaurants um what are you guys seeing it's in, in and also to that same point it seems like it seems like really quickly the willamette valley at least the association people kind of came up with like you know what we're going to try some new things we're not able to get to restaurants but we're going to do some new things we're going to just all of a sudden, like the same day that everything was shutting down, it's like, we're going to start delivering to you. We've got you know, our winemaker is going to start delivering to your house. We can ship for free within Portland. And like, yeah, it's about that, like, like, there must have been a lot of communication with, within the association. What, what, how everybody kind of pulled together and started changing the way you guys do things. That's what I'm seeing. And it's so new, right? Like, so it's going to be such a struggle for all the in the reasons you're you're saying with restaurants closing which is just catastrophic and devastating and, and all that and with distribution but i also feel like there is a lot of very quick um momentum with doing things differently and we have we have a really great uh, distribution system in general and i feel like there's a lot of intelligence with these companies so it there's there's hope and it's and it's just happening so i think a lot of this is going to be what happens over the next two months, right? But we have a lot of momentum with the wines we've been making because we've been at it a while and we've got good partners and we've got good pull through on these wines that are in front of me and we've got orders, but now it's like, what's gonna happen now? You know, once, how is that gonna get refreshed? And so we'll see. And so we are trying to be as creative and adaptable as we can. We're trying to get to customers, work with our distribution partners and see how we can best serve this new knit, this, time you know and i think april is going to be one of these months that we tell our grandkids about and i don't think any of us know what's going to happen right now but we're just trying to be you know just to be relevant and intelligent and try to be creative with solutions and, and see what happens speaking of grandkids you've got two young sons our high school age-ish right <laughs> So, I thought you were going to be grandkids. I'm like, well, <laughs> not yet. Um, I am not yet. For your own yeah. children, like, they're at home, but you're still working. You still have to leave your house because your job requires you to be at the winery. And so how is, what is your day-to-day -day life looking like these last few weeks? Well, it's been interesting because honestly, the day-to-day, -day, I've been home a lot for the most most part, because over the last few years, I haven't been doing as very much a day to day winemaking. And we've got three facilities, we have three winemakers and phenomenal teams within each facility. And so I've been doing more meetings than ever, more planning, trying to figure out how we're going to adjust how we process stuff, planning for the harvest stuff, doing things like this and doing a lot of it from home. Yeah, and that's been happening. And it's, it's been interesting. And, you know, with my kids, yeah, it's definitely challenging. I have a 15, my, actually tomorrow is his 16th birthday, my son. Oh, wow. <laughs> and so we're going to get a takeout pizza. It's our first takeout thing we've had ever since, you know, Marjorie. Okay. Um, and I have an 11-year-old. And, you know, I'm fortunate. They're great kids. They're a little bit older, which I think is very helpful because a lot of my friends that have 
smaller kids are just bouncing off the walls, you know, and if they would, if this would have happened, I'm thinking about you. but you know, it is still this thing, like major eye roll. I was on a conference call for two hours today and I go down to check on my kids and they're just plugged in and they know, you know, that they should be doing these things, but school hasn't officially started. And so I told them on Monday, like, this is like the lockdown. This is what we're doing, you know, and, and I'm serious. This is ridiculous. Cause it's like, I have to micromanage them and it drives me nuts. And the, like, the major teenage eye roll is, is just ridiculous. It's easy to just let them forget about them, but then that's not gonna work. They're gonna turn yellow, zombies, like blowing up people on the computer, eating to, like junk food, whatever they can find, and they're and sleeping until two. That's what they wanna do. It's ridiculous. What about you? What's it like with the boys right now? <laughs> they just started their online school today. So we went and picked up Chromebooks at the school. So there's the school has Chromebooks for all the students to, then, to do their online learning. So today the kids were kind of excited because they got to play with the computer. Um, but it was really distracting. They were not following the lessons and I couldn't get any work done. But prior to today, um, yeah, they just had a lot of screen time more than ever. So they're loving this yeah. time because they could play video games like all day. And yeah. so we yeah. try to keep them, you know, moving and being outside. It's been rainy. And so, yeah, in order for us to get any like amount of work done, it's like, they gotta, because we have, um, for those of you watching, we have nine-year-old twin boys and they're in third grade. So they are the kind of boys that do have the very high energy. They are jumping off the walls. They want constant attention. So it's been a challenge. Yeah, I think, I think one thing that I appreciate coming out of this is that I think we've all collectively given ourselves the okay that we're not all <laughs> going to be put together on our calls. There's going to be dog barking or jumping yeah. around. <laughs> <laughs> the kids are going to be like, Dad, I don't care if you're talking to the CEO of whatever. I need food now. <laughs> you know, so. Yeah. Snack. Yeah. I, I wonder if the outfits are like the, the business wear is going to change. Because I think right now it's kind of like the mullet for fashion. It's like scarf on top, yoga pants on bottom kind of thing. You know, <laughs> like most people are like doing stuff like that, which is. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Strange, strange times. It's been crazy. Yeah. Was, yes. um, getting encouraging us to drink a lot more of this. Yeah. So, so speaking yeah. Of, tell us what are we what do we got here? Well, I have, um, and I think you have two of the three of these. I've I have a, a rosé that we are have just released. So this is a, a entirely Pinot Noir uh, rosé from Stoller, and this is a wine that we've been making since 2005. So for a very long time, and it's really grown to be a very solid part of our portfolio and it constitutes quite a large volume. It averages about 10,000 cases of production and it is, it's, you know, it's really beautiful. It's light, it's aromatic, it's fresh. It's got a lot of acidity, doesn't have any drying tannin. It's just really beautiful, especially right now. It's nice to sit out and look at the rain. It's actually sunny right now, but very nice a kind of spring wine. So it's good for quarantine day drinking. And for those watching, who might be used to a Pinot Noir being the grape being red. Um, what what are some like basics you might share with people about how, how this is more on the pinkish side? Yeah, so that's a good question. And I think it's interesting too. It's kind of like a how it's made look at, at wines, but you, you there's a lot of rosés all over the world and they are made from a host of different types of red grapes. So this is made from the Pinot Noir because that's what we grow in our area and grow a lot of. So basically you're treating a red wine like a white wine. So instead of picking the grapes when they're ready for harvesting and fermenting them with the skins and the berries in big tanks, and that gives you red wine because as the alcohol gets formed from fermentation, it pulls the color out from the skins and makes that beautiful, rich red you know, color and flavor. We take the Pinot Noir grapes when we harvest them and we put them right into our wine press. And so they don't spend a lot of time on the skins. You just get that juice. And the inside of most red grapes, it's white pulp, it's white material. So there's not a lot of color that you get from that technique. So that is, again, that's how we make our white wines. They go right into the press. And so ro rosé is, you know, the white the white wine of the red grape type of a thing, right? And uh, we ferment that juice in tanks and then we uh, bottle it pretty early, uh, early on in its life. And that really ensures that freshness and that vibrancy of acidity and uh, aromatics and such. Nice. 
So nice. what else? What else do you have in your yeah. lineup? We we don't we got some of that Chardonnay in our club shipment and drank it like the next day. So we don't have any to join you with, but maybe you can tell us a little bit because Chardonnay is some. It's one of my favorite grapes, and it's always fun to talk about. Because I worked at a winery thousands of years ago, and always nine times out of ten, people would come in and say, "Oh, I don't drink Chardonnay," and I loved introducing them to Oregon Chardonnay because it almost always changed their mind about what they thought about Chardonnay. And I know this one specifically is, you know, is not the Chardonnay people think of when they think of the like 80s, you know, buttery Chardonnay. Yeah, absolutely. I remember that time too, is the ABC phenomenon, anything but Chardonnay. And people come into the tasting room and Chardonnay is making a huge renaissance in the state of Oregon and it's echoing and being demanded you know, out of state in restaurants and wine shops, it's still a very limited amount of what the state grows. It's only about 5% of what we grow. It's probably a little bit bigger with the data right now. Maybe it's closer to seven, but that's not a lot for wine grapes for the whole state. So in a world where Chardonnay is the number one varietal grown and consumed, we're again, very small. Uh, in Oregon, most of our growing areas are considered cooler climate growing regions. And so that's why Pinot Noir does so well. It likes this longer, you know, season, more temperate, cooler fall. So you can really preserve this delicate, intricate layered flavors that it has. Chardonnay is, is similar. It, it does very well in this cool climate. I mean, think of Burgundy, the best, you know, white wines of the world, arguably, a white Burgundies. And it's a similar climate, not the same, but similar, cooler growing climate. And so well, that is reflected in the, the Oregon Chardonnay is, is, is the climate that it's grown in and the soils we grow in. And uh, this Chardonnay here is in our Dundee Hills tier, like all three of these wines. And this is a Chardonnay we've been making for quite a long time. And it is produced by pressing the grapes, fermenting them in stainless steel tanks, keeping that beautiful freshness. But also as our vineyard has aged and as, as this wine has evolved in terms of its its age of vine and its style, we've introduced a little bit of concrete. So we have a tank that's made of concrete and we ferment the Chardonnay in that. And the difference between that and a stainless tank is concrete's porous. It's not as porous as a barrel, but it does let a little air and oxygen in, develops your wine differently then. And the wine interacting with the concrete gives a little nuance, the flavor of that minerality, literally from being in the concrete vessel. And I think it's a beautiful combination. And we also use a, a small amount of neutral, meaning barrels that are used more than four times. So you don't get oakiness from them per se, but you get that oxygen, kind of like the, that I was talking about with the, the concrete and it adds a little more richness. So this is a combination of the three of those techniques, but the, the end game here is this wine is very bright. It's got a lot of citrus and freshness. I keep saying that word freshness, it really is equating to the acidity that's in the wine, a lot of length. And I would say of, I think all of our wines are very versatile and, and food friendly. It's the region that we're in and the wines we grow naturally are that way. But for me, people ask me, what should I bring to this party? You know, I don't know what wine to bring. I'd bring any out of these three, but this in particular is Chardonnay with the, the tart citrus, the bright acidity, and there's really not a lot of tannin. It pairs with anything, almost anything, and by itself as well. So That's yeah. awesome. We've, yeah. Got, we've got Noah Cheek saying rosé all day, so we have <laughs> a big fan. And Noah, nice. we love you, man. And he's on Instagram, Cheeky Barbecue, awesome guy. Um, Tracy nice. Timmons sounds delicious, absolutely delicious. Hopefully you're... Um, drinking some some wine as we speak. And Chris Gavin, well, I'm a Valley Pinot. I think we're gonna talk about that next. Pretty soon. Well, well I uh, wanna know, what is your favorite, what is your favorite style of Chardonnay that you drink at home? Because you guys make a few different mm -hmm. kinds. We do, and it rotates. You know, that's the thing. That's the luxury that I have of being able to be surrounded by all these different wines. Like it's not a bad thing to have happen, but it just depends kind of on the mood and what you're making and such. And like, lately I've been really loving our reserve Chardonnay. It's a Chardonnay that we source our oldest blocks of fruit at the Stoller Estate. And those vines are typically, they were planted 20, 22 years ago. And so they have some concentration just by the nature of, of the age. The vines are deep and really balanced, balanced wine vines. And the, the Chardonnay is fermented in barrels. And so you get this creaminess, but it's not too much oak. It's just a little undercurrent of that oak spice. And 
I think that kind of hits all points for me because it's got the texture, it's got the weight, the aromatics, the acidity, it's got some age on it. We typically age that a couple of years in bottle before release. And I think for me, especially right now, kind of a cold spring, that's been really lovely with lighter dishes and, and things, you know, like roasted chicken and that. Dungeness crab and the reserve Chardonnay, or Chardonnay really, but Oregon Chardonnay and Dungeness crab, yes. That's what I did on my birthday. My birthday was the apocalypse, March 13th, when everything started shutting down. I was like, <laughs> all these different things. I'm like, okay, this is self-survival. I'm going to go to Northwest Fresh. It's a local seafood purveyor. Get three Dungeness crabs. I've got great Chardonnay at home. I could eat that every day, you know, probably shouldn't, but I could. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. We actually have um, one of my favorite recipes from our cookbook is Dungeness crab cakes that we cook on the grill and we <laughs> pair them with Chardonnay. I think we take care of Chardonnay or sparkling wine, which oh, yeah. most traditional sparkling wine, as you know, has Chardonnay in it. Yes. And I think sparkling wine is another one of those wines, like the Dundee Hill Chardonnay. It goes with everything, with yeah. you know, it's never, never a bad combination with sparkling wine, really. That's awesome. So yeah. let's talk Pinot. Pinot. Talk Pinot Noir. So yeah, this. Yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah yes, good. Noir. Good, good, good. So this is a what happens when your husband sees the Pinot Noir bottle at home before you film. It's like probably like a little splash left in here. <laughs> That's okay. Um, he's hiding right now, which is fine. But so Dundee Hills Pinot Noir. This really is our flagship wine for, for the Stoller family estate. First off, Pinot Noir is the dominant grape of the, the state of Oregon. It's over 60% of what the state grows for wine grapes. Willamette Valley is the epicenter for growing the majority of the Pinot Noir that's produced in our state. Stoller family estate, where this is all, all sourced from, heart of a Dundee Hills, and that's where the first Pinot Noir vines were planted in the 60s. And so um, a little backstory about Pinot, but this is a wine that constitutes our entire vineyard. So Stoller is uh, located on a hillside, the winery's at the bottom and the vineyard sweeps this hill and it's over 200 acres of wine grapes and it's one contiguous hillside. So you look up at it and it's, it's, it's beautiful. It's very, um, it, it, yeah, it's just this big picturesque vineyard. And that's a, that's a large size, right? You've got a couple hundred acres of grapes. It ranges between 200 and almost 650, 700 feet in elevation. Different age of Pinot Noir vines, different clones of Pinot Noir, different rootstocks. And then also 200 acres is not all the same, obviously, even with elevation differences. Some soil's a little rockier, some's less, but it's primarily all volcanic soil, so very consistent. This wine has a little bit of the whole hill. So... We have old vines in here. We have young vines. And I feel like for any of any out of all the wines we make, this is really tells the best story every single year about our, our site because you literally are getting all the elevation. So you get this kind of mosaic of this one place and this one vintage, you know, that each year and you get a real good sense of what's happening. And this Pinot Noir, we produce it in a style that really is trying to be balanced. I know that's said a lot of wines, but what I mean by that is we're not trying to add too much new oak barrel to guide it one way. We're not trying to extract so much richness out of the grapes. We want to keep a real balance to it. We want a nice fruit. It's really important to have aromatic wines and textured wines. So I think we try to stay out of the way and show off the site as best as we can on, on this. And I think, you know, for all those reasons, it's a really good representation of our, our estate and our growing area and our vintages that we have. So we just had a question come up and it might also reference back to the Chardonnay from Noah. What flavors are developed from aging in the bottle versus something neutral like stainless steel? So maybe bottle aging uh, comment. Sure. So bottle aging, um, no matter if it's stainless steel or barrel from the Chardonnay, as time, as time goes on in a bottle, wines tend to uh, soften, tannins tend to kind of polymerize. So you get a little bit more of a smooth profile. A lot over years, fruit will change in the bottle. It'll go less from this fresh, vibrant fruit to more dried fruit and sometimes some hay and all that with time. So that depends with our with our reserve Chardonnay that's been fermented in barrels versus stainless steel Chardonnay fermented in this Dundee Hills. The reserve Chardonnay by fermenting in these barrels and spending a year plus in the barrels 
gets, again, more oxygen intake, more contact with the dead yeast, which is called lees, which breaks down over time and is, gives a creaminess. And that's a big difference than a stainless steel fermented, really bright chardonnay that doesn't get any oxygen in there. So those are two different styles to begin with. And then when you age our reserved chardonnay in the bottle after it's done being put together, it even comes together more. You get more of its texture, more of a creaminess and just a nice balance of that fruit and the, and the weight of the wine itself. So it's interesting to, to watch wines change in bottle and every wine is different and every vintage is different as well. And there's no magic formula about how long. People ask me a lot, like, how long do, should I age this in the bottle? And I'm like, first of all, you're probably not going to. So I don't you know. We, we don't. <laughs> I'm glad you asked, but, you know, it's, I feel like Oregon Pinot can age beautifully for a long time. I've had 20-year-old Pinots and older, but I think kind of the sweet spot for a lot of our Pinot Noirs that we produce is after two, three years in the bottle, maybe four. And then after that, it's beautiful, but I really like the vibrant fruit and those, you know, younger aged wines still have that with a little bottle age gives it a softness of the tannin. So it's part of the, the mystery about wine, right? Is like, how does it change? How does a vintage make it? How does nature dictate it? There's so many variables that go into each wine that you can't ever recreate one really. Yeah. Unless yeah. Ox wine maybe, but I don't know. <laughs> one thing we chatted about last week was just reinforcing that it's, it's farming, right? It's like the same yeah. challenge as any agricultural uh, professional has to deal with. You're dealing with the, the random rain, hail, hot, cool, uh, what, whatever. So it, it, I think sometimes when we get questions, well, it, it can revolve around there's this beautiful bottle, but it starts in the plants. It starts in the earth. Absolutely. It absolutely does. And that is the mystery of it again is it starts in the earth and every vintage is so different with what happens each day in the vineyard and how you farm it as well. And then that piece of earth. So even if we had, you could say I was going to make a Pinot Noir from seven different sites in the Willamette Valley and same clone, same age of vine, same vintage, and we picked it at the same time. And use all the same techniques, they'd, they'd be different wines because that little combination of where it's grown adds such a big part of its story. So I think that's what us wine like lovers here that are making wine and growing grapes and talk about wine and, and having, you know, wine writings and passions. I think that's what you, it's intriguing. Like you never will get enough, like there's always something new about it and something that you learn and it's never going to be the same. People ask me a lot, what's your favorite wine that you've ever made? And yeah. it's kind of like asking what's your favorite kid. And, and luckily I don't have, you know, 700 children because that would be a real issue <laughs> <laughs> of my sanity. I don't think I'd be sitting here. Um, but you know, they're also unique, I guess is what my answer is. And, and I think it's beautiful, really is. That's awesome. Well, I've got a, I have a few more questions for you. But you mentioned the property when you're talking about um, you know, you mentioned you know, the beautiful, uh, I can't, you know, 200 acres of beautiful hills. And I think that's one of the I would think that's probably one of the most photographed vineyards in all of Willamette Valley wine country. I would think. Oh, my God. Yeah. probably the most boomerang. Like but, it, but it's also so for me one of the things that 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 keeps me going to the property over and over again and keeps us in the wine club besides just beautiful wines is I don't know if this is intentional, but it's one of the most family friendly wineries that exists that I've been to. And I know a lot of wineries, um, very few here in Oregon, but in other regions that are highly discouraging for families and children. And, and you know what, that I think there should be some properties that are, should be, adult experiences. They don't want kids around running and screaming, but I feel like the way you guys have it set up, it's so welcoming to families. And as parents, it makes me feel so not ashamed to bring my kids to go do something we love to do. And also we love the industry. We want our kids to understand that this isn't just an alcoholic beverage. This is, this is agriculture and these are, you know, farmers and these are people creating these beautiful products. And so we like introducing our children to really beautiful spaces out here. So I, I don't know if you can speak to that, but I, I just feel like it's a very family friendly place. And I don't know if, if you guys work to, to, to make it that way, but your property is so beautiful. It's so open. There's 
Adirondack chairs everywhere. You serve food, and it's just it seems to be very a nice place that people go to often to bring, and bring their families, and they feel comfortable bringing their families. Yeah, absolutely. It, it is very unique in that way. And I think the more I think about it, I think, you know, one of the reasons, the, the origin of this is the owner and the founder, Bill Stoller, he's a third generation Oregonian. He grew up farming on the site, it was in his family. It was a large turkey farm. He went to school for business locally, started a company, became very successful and bought this piece of property back and started the vineyard. And he has this really long look at everything. Like when we built the, the winery at Stoller in 2005, the very first facility, because now we have two on the property, it was built for 200 years. And I think in Bill's maybe subconscious mind, he sets it up this way because he's trying to market to your children. So he's getting your children ready to start buying Stoller wine in 30 years. And it's genius. You know, even the babies, you're like, oh, be a customer. <laughs> You'll have some like memory of a tire swing and you'll be yeah. the big ambassador so maybe he knows that and that kind of echoes all the stuff that we do it's it's brilliant really <laughs> so funny because uh, our kids will know forever because our family picture when they were like our christmas card picture when they were like seven was they were swinging on the tire swing no but i'm serious <laughs> hashtag still our wine you'll see more boomerangs than any other hashtag i've ever seen in my life Absolutely. Yeah. Just even Google search Stoller tire swing. And, you know, we're thinking about doing, you know, that tree is about 75 years old. So we're kind of thinking about having a birthday for it and like talking about all the things it's gone through and seen, you know, and it's, it's, yeah. it's something really like peaceful about watching this majestic Oak tree. For those of you who don't know, and it's, in the, it's at the bottom of our vineyard and there's a tire swing hanging there and you look up at the vineyard and it's just, it's gorgeous. Yeah. We posted pictures at yeah. the bottom of the year afterwards. Yeah, there's yeah. Beautiful. it's a beautiful property and it's really fabulous that we've been able to create something that people do feel comfortable and they can, we can share it. You know, part of it's the natural beauty of the site. Huge part about it is the team and the ownership and the vision, obviously. And then, you know, just the nature of it. Just it's wine is meant to share. And I think it's really, it's really special. Sometimes I'll tell you it looks like a state park out there. So not right now, actually. We've but, been there for Mother's Day. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh my goodness. Go on a Wednesday. Go yeah. On a Wednesday. I'm like, wow. I go to the tasting room really quick. I'm like, oh my goodness, what just happened out here today? You know? It's incredible. I've been really, really busy and the staff feel seem overwhelmed. The staff at you it's like such a well-oiled machine. Nobody ever seems overwhelmed. It's like you guys know how to handle 10, you know how to handle a thousand people at one time. It's just, yeah, it runs very smoothly. We have a, a really good team and that is the thing. Like you can have a great business, but you can't have a great business without the people. And that's something that has served the brand so well. We've been very fortunate to that. We have good leadership. We've got, we just got a good combination. I mean, nothing's perfect, you know, but it's pretty phenomenal. I feel lucky. It doesn't feel like going to work when I, you know, a lot of times it's like, wow, it's cool. And it takes that. I mean, it takes really, great people and passionate people to run the front of the house. And I'll tell you, I love people, but it is a huge challenge talking to people all day about the same wines and being, and getting all the questions. I, <laughs> I probably get fired from that job. Look, <laughs> 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 well, that'd be nice for like four, five people. And after a while, I'll be like, I can't hide it on my face. Wine, like, drink it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's red. You'll like it. But yeah. I'm not going to be doing that all the time. So, uh, well, Melissa, I do. Have, I know Mary has another question or two, but um, I heard a rumor you may have a smoker on site. Is that true? I do. Yeah, I got my husband a Weber smoker for um, for his, his Father's Day, something like that. So it's like a gift that gives the whole family back, right? Yeah. Are you guys yeah. cooking on it right now? Since you're both at home, not going out to eat very much. Oh yeah, lots and lots of cooking, a lot. Like I've done a lot of cooking today. I've already made a quiche, banana bread, and I've got some chicken thighs marinating and like just cooking a lot. I love to cook anyways, and he likes to cook too. So and we cook a lot because we're like, we're, we're neighbors. And just for all you, like we were supposed to hang out this weekend. Us, like yeah. we're, we're get us our families together because we're really close. And now and, we're doing it. It's now we're doing it. But yeah, it's kind of natural anyways to cook a lot because of where we live so yeah. far. But yes, how about you guys? Have you guys been cooking, cooking a lot? Yes. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, we've been cooking a lot, and 
Also, getting lazy. I have a bunch of those like little pouch zipper things from Costco that I thought you were going to say the, the wine purse. No, I think like last <laughs> night we had our kids those um 90 second like Indian food packets because I was like I can't I can't because we cook so much for work. And I was yeah. like I can't do it anymore. So we we just in my yeah. microwave for them. But you gotta do what you gotta do. You do. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And those we're, very, we're very fortunate that we get to work with some awesome people that you know we get to keep pushing the envelope on the types of food we cook and we we usually test recipes two, three, four times before we put it up on the blog. We do a lot of recipe testing and such, but to be honest, right now we wish we were putting up more content. It's just the reality of the situation is we only have so much time in the day and and we thought maybe instead of the food and the recipes, we thought we could bring some of the storytelling to our audience that we have traditionally done through blog posts and other things. Um, and, and so that we've been cooking certainly but like you said we live out in the middle of nowhere so we don't go out we don't go out to restaurants that often anyway because it takes us a half hour to get to any single restaurant with the exception of like two so we just we just anyway we're always cooking but i am curious what are you drinking these days like what have you been drinking the last couple of weeks during this whole thing and it's okay it's not okay oh, yeah, yeah no honestly i've been drinking so much wine that I have had so I've a lot. <laughs> I have a lot of Stoller wine. I have a lot of Washington wines. I have some wines from New Zealand. I've got all I got a bunch of Chablis. And I was on this track of like drinking, drinking about like last weekend. I was like, I've got to like slow down. Like I, I mean, not, I'm waiting till five and I'd be all these zoom happy hours and things. And it just goes. And I'm like, Oh, I did a bottle and a half of wine or a bottle of wine today and a copy paste. So honestly, the last little bit, I haven't been drinking that. I've been drinking uh, vodka sodas because they're super light, just citrus. Like I put almost a whole lemon in there and like lime and it just, I don't, I'll just drink a couple of those or else I'm just like, yeah, I've got to be on some sort of, some kind of discipline here or else I'm going to come out of this quarantine and like my liver is going to fail and I'm going to be like 200 pounds. Yeah. So it's the struggle is real. It's for real. Yeah. yeah. But that's all. It's all in balance. So we'll see how the week how it goes. How about you too? What have you been? What have you been drinking? Booze. Yeah, booze. A lot, a lot yeah. Of, uh, he a lot of wine. We. Yeah, we've been drinking a lot of wine. A lot of, a lot of rosé. A lot of like light, fresh, white wines. And then we'll switch to red. And then we'll switch to red. <laughs> it, it's it's yeah. like. I think my sister posted this great meme that was like the coffee oh, the, handoff. The coffee hands off to the wine. To yeah. the wine for the afternoon. So that's pretty much our day. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. we're going to drink mostly local and it's a, we, we just have a lot of local and all of the like wine club pickups were coordinated like the weekend, everything shut down. So we have all of our local wines. Yeah. So yeah. We've been Drinking a lot of local, a lot of whites. Oh, uh, we've got Daniel DeBlanc's tequila, soda water, yes. lemon, and lime. Oh, hey, nice. Try, try grilling the lemon and lime. We have been, it's like, yes. oh, you we grill the lemon and lime. and We've been making simple syrups out of grilled lemons. So we take the grilled lemons, make a simple syrup out of the lemon juice. And I've been doing a lot of gin drinks with the lemon. So okay. I, my, my like cocktail would be something gin based. Say. Yeah. Lemon. I'm gonna try that. That sounds delicious. What have you been cooking? What are you two? And what are we gonna look at to eat? I'm. You guys are making me hungry. Think about foods. I know how talented you are, and I want to know what is going on. Red meat. It's been a little yeah. red meat heavy. So, so first uh, for tonight, we did some ribs. We didn't want to eat on camera just because we thought that'd be a little awkward. Give us feedback if you want us. We got Pinot Noir barbecue sauce glazed ribs. Um, and then we have some New, uh, New York Manhattans. These have been smoked and then seared. Um, yeah, now that my hands are covered in food, Mary's going to get the book because I know how to touch it. No, because he made a recipe from the book. One of them, probably the rest. One of the recipes we're most excited about. We did this, cooked this recipe at Feast a couple years ago. Feast Portland. So basically what we did, we partnered with Snake River Farms and Big Green Egg, which was amazing. And we, 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 we reverse here, which means we smoked a, a steak, a New York strip, 
um, for about an hour, and then we finished it over a hot heat to give it a sear. So it's got a smoky element and then seared, and then we made a duck fat granola. And this that, is a picture from the book. Yeah, that's a picture from the book that technically we're not supposed to share, but we're doing it anyway. We're breaking the rules. It's our book. It's our book. But thank you, Penguin Iron Mouse and Sasquatch. We love you guys. Um, yeah. Um, the duck fat. The duck fat granola. That's what we're eating right now. So, oh, my goodness. I don't know if you can see this. Uh, it's so good. And to Dan's comment, I'm jealous that you have those trees in your backyard, Oregon and citrus trees, <laughs> at least the northern part of the state. Not so nice. doesn't work out so well. No, I love, I wish. So where can people find your book? Can I see your book cover? You sure can. So, <laughs> so funny story. Uh, the amazing team at Sasquatch, uh, our publisher, uh, okay. was able to work on getting our book released early. Uh, so the original launched April 28th. And the book is really meant to be about a food and wine experience that we, we get to, to experience, you know, here in Oregon. It's about pairing wine and wood-fired food, grilled or barbecue, um, and how a smoke is just an ingredient like anything else. Just like a barrel is just an ingredient in a nice bottle of wine, right? Like it shouldn't taste exactly like oak, but it's there. Just yeah. Like smoke. yeah. And so they released the book early, which was amazing, is amazing. Um, but with distribution and releasing it early, uh, yeah, just the, the, just the people don't have it yet. So the Amazon distribution centers don't have it yet. But yeah, I mean, we're still sticking with the April 28th date. So I'm pretty sure it will be in everybody's hands at least by April 28th. Those yeah. who pre-ordered it and then it'll be in stores after that. Yeah. That's but. awesome. Congratulations, you guys. That's so cool. Thank you. You know, like, like you, I mean, we had this huge, it took three months to put together a marketing plan and, and the book tour and, and All these you know, events. within a week, we were like, like oh, crap, crap, I don't crap, think we're going to be doing crap. that. <laughs> Everything got canceled, right? But yeah. at the end of the day, it, it, it was an opportunity for us to think creatively. And yeah. if we can't do the book tour now, maybe we take the virtual book tour through these experiences yeah. and bring it to them. Yeah, because yeah. we have been fortunate. We get to cook and cater through Ember and Vine, through out the Willamette Valley uh, in Southwest Washington. and. And, and it's just, you know, I, I think for us, it's just about this. It's about hanging out together. You're on your backyard. You're grilling with your family. You're drinking some wine. And and that's, you know, that's the thing. It's all the things. <laughs> yeah. Well, I know firsthand how you, you both do this. And you guys do such an awesome job. And, yeah, I mean, all your recipes. I, I was sharing earlier before the video started that, I'm, I have I get their newsletter that they send out and they have a recipe for burnt ends that it's pork like, belly burnt ends. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It was like a game changer. It's one of these, I think I need to try to find some pork belly and go through all that because those, my friends just ate those and they were gone, just gone. The whole, the whole thing. It took like hours to make them, but amazing. Yeah. Yeah. That's one of the few recipes. That's probably one of our top, two, three recipes on the website. So that's also in the book. So that recipe is online and in the book so that people have a nice yeah. version of There's it. A print. People just love print, you know? Uh, mo know? Most of the recipes are original, so you won't find them on the blog, but a few are some of our favorites too, but yeah. That's fantastic. I feel like you've gone like yeah. 20 minutes over. So, so I, we can talk all day long. You're supposed yeah. to be talking all day long, but. Yeah. So first, I, I can't, Thank you enough for joining this uh, this experience. Yes. And to those who are watching, that's the, the bells ringing. That's not Sammy. Okay. You, well, we have a UPS driver here, so Eva. That's the perfect look. <laughs> I don't even think about it. the nicest dog in the world, but she sounds ferocious. He's like Melissa. You said you're going to be off by now. It's my yeah. turn to play. We're gonna sign off. I'll show you how ferocious she is. I'm just yeah. looking at the poor UPS guy, and she probably go like lick him. Eva, yeah. Eva, settle down. Oh. Okay. Crazy. Yeah, sorry about that, but I didn't think about putting her. Outside. Well, Melissa, on behalf of Mary and I, I just want to say thank you to you and the team for being wicked awesome, and we can't wait to connect again. Same, you guys. Thank you for having me. This is really cool.
I appreciate thank you. you. Thank you so much. And we'll leave links to your website in the comments too, so people know how to find you. And for those who are watching, thank you very much. Any questions, keep them coming. Yeah, keep them coming. Cheers, everybody. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Bye.